Corner. I have Pete Koch back, who's been here before. He was an NFL football player. He's an actor. He's a model. He's a fitness trainer. He knows a lot about a lot, and it's a pleasure to have him on here. Actually, he's very well known for doing with Clint Eastwood, Heartbreak Ridge, Big Sweet. Yeah, good to be with you, Rick. Yeah, good to be with you, too. People mistake you for, like, um, who's the other guy, the wrestler? Um, yes. Uh... You know what I get? Patrick Swayze. And, I see Patrick and, Swayze. And, 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 I, and I get, uh, really, just the other day, somebody said, you look like Richard Gere. Oh, that for sure. And I've been hearing that for a long that time. That for sure. Who was the big wrestler you said, that someone said you look like, too? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar, yeah. Sure. Especially when he did uh, Heartbreak Ridge. Yeah. And I, well, at that time, I was 300 pounds at that time. Yeah, sure. that's a lot of weight. Yeah. Okay, so we just had lunch. We're talking about doing stuff, and, and Pete wants to do something with his own show, which I'm going to help him with, and I think he should. He's a big audience out there. We talk about a lot of things in training and nutrition and injuries and sports, and uh, he's got a world of knowledge, and I thought we could talk about a couple of subjects. A lot of the things I get in the emails on are guys in their well, late 40s, 50s, and 60s, even 70s, that have trained, quit, and come back, and they don't know where to begin, or those who never have and want to do something with themselves because they've gotten totally out of shape. Um, <clears throat> you talked about a lot of these guys that don't work out, have joint pain. Yeah. You're going to have joint pain whether you train or whether you don't. So I, for me, and I told you, working through it uh, helps. It does. And as, as you know, I'm a personal trainer, and I've, I've worked with uh, all kinds of actors like uh, Benicio Del Toro, and who's 50 himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, as he gets older, and lots of the folks that I work with, they, they get older. I'm 53 myself, and we need to adjust our training. We need to be smart and sensible. It's not a matter of trying to fit a square, a square peg into a round hole. It's, it's a matter of understanding that you're going to be training we're going to yeah. be training we're in this thing for the long run that's, yeah yeah that's until we go to sleep you know for good so <laughs> we need to adjust our training yeah uh yet keep it yet keep it functional so that we continue to get gains or at the least mitigate you know what's happening with at through the aging process uh, i think there's a number of different strategies out there that we can talk about i know your audience is largely group, um, interested in bodybuilding and yet I love bodybuilding. That's that's my foundation before sure. I even play football is is bodybuilding. But there's maybe more practical ways we can approach our training as we age. I agree with you with that. The thing is is that, that once a bodybuilder, always a bodybuilder, although you <laughs> you want to grow out of that men, that mental state. But you know, at my age I go out and I'm, I'm out with people and say, geez, you stay in great shape, what do you do? Okay, I'm not where I was thirty years ago, I never will be, but for my age I'm doing pretty good through injuries. Doing great. And you take a lot of pride in that because working out is one of the rewards that you get out of that is you take it with you wherever you go. It's always your body, it's always with you. And it always impresses people when they see somebody who stays in shape at an older age. But it's hard for a lot of guys to get to that point. They've, they've abused their bodies over the years of drinking and eating wrong and no exercise. And now they have to undo everything and it's hard to undo. It is, but there's a way to do it. And we, we I think we need to keep our target on, on the prize, on, on the distant prize, which is as we get older, we want to maintain a quality of our life physically, but also emotionally and mentally. We know that uh, exercise is directly tethered to how happy we're going to feel totally. within our lives. Yeah. So how are we going to go about, how are we going to get through these, you know, sort of our golden years and, and uh, so that we're in a happy and, uh, and, and in, a, in a functionally strong way. That word functional is, is overused or misused many times, but simply getting in and out of a chair and doing it with yeah. some energy. So yeah. that means, in my mind, I'll give you one fast example. I always encourage people, as they get older in particular, to be careful <clears throat> about shifting your training towards all machines, including the leg press, because is there some carryover between a leg press and getting out of a chair? I suppose that there, there is. However, there's a greater carryover between squatting. And I don't mean loading up a big, heavy bar, but working on but the, but the, the mobility and flexibility and strength required to squat up and down, even if it's just your own body weight and CrossFit, we call an air squat. That's really important. It's going to have carryover to the quality of your life, your life as you age. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um... This comes to my mind right now. We just had lunch and I got out of the chair. Well, I have a bad knee, and so getting out of the chair is tough. Leg presses never help that at all. It won't. However, what I do, there's a leg press in the gym that you lie flat in your back, and it's a slide that you push your body up and down. Mm. So when you're in that position, you're in a squatting position, only flat, but my heel's high, my mind thinks I'm actually squatting, and so I can push myself in a squat position that doesn't affect me in the leg press like that. And there's an example of making a, a very strong choice. So, so 
and these are really important decisions. Sometimes we take it for granted. You walk into a gym or you get up in the morning and you say, I'm going to work out today. There's a million things that you can do that would qualify as working out today. And certainly hundreds of different uh, strength training exercises and machine choices. Yeah. But they're really powerful decisions. Yeah. And some of those choices can take you in the wrong direction. Yeah. Part of what I wanted to discuss a little bit today is that, and I've got a background in CrossFit, I'm a, I'm a CrossFit coach, and we know a couple things about CrossFit. It's been, it's been out there for 16 years now, and here's what we know. CrossFit can build incredible bodies and create incredible athletic results through strength, mobility, speed, quickness, etc. However, there's some drawback to it. We know that the incidence of shoulder injury, Achilles tendon injury, is disproportionate to what it should be in the general population of folks trying to be physically fit. Um, so an offshoot that we're seeing a popular fitness trend is going to be gyms like Orange Theory and F45. It's one of the biggest chains in Australia, which is going to be coming to the United States mm -hmm. now, where, where folks can walk into a gym. It'll have a little bit of a community feel like CrossFit has. You'll have a coach, which is really nice. won't be nearly as expensive as a personal trainer, so you'll get coaching, but they've removed some of the borderline uh, risky exercises associated with CrossFit. Okay. You said something about being on the wall, like you could watch it? Yes. Uh, it's an interesting business model. Um, F45 says that you can run an entire gym and accommodate classes of 15 or 20 people working out at one time and do it with a total of two employees. One person basically checking you in and the other person basically getting the class ready and pointing to monitors. It might even be one coach could do this. So they've removed the coaching uh, every CrossFit class has one coach out in front saying, here's how you swing a kettlebell, here's how you do a box jump, etc. Well, they're going to have all uh, pre-recorded messages that are going to go up on monitors, and the entire class at the beginning will observe. Uh, this isn't just F45. There's a, a number of, of gyms that are, that are populating the, the fitness world at this time where the class will just watch the demonstration of the exercise, go through a warm-up, some practice of it, and they're off and running it. They're not sophisticated exercises. Yeah, yeah. How to do a push-up properly, etc. Right. And off you go. <clears throat> That's important. It's uniform coaching. So it's not just what this the way that this particular coach wants to do it. It's been tried and proven, and they believe that this is the best way how to coach somebody to do a burpee, and off you go. Now, this is a class? It is a class group exercise. Yeah. What if everybody can't do certain things? That's where uh, modifications come into play. And I think this is an incredibly uh, important part of it. Some people who are not really familiar with CrossFit, for example, don't understand that exercises can be modified for those. Mm -hmm. If you can't step onto a box that's this tall, maybe you can step onto a box that, that, that's that. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Even when you go to the gym and you have an injury and you say, you know, like I can't squat anymore because of my knee. I find something better that I can do that still is going to work the leg. There's ways around. There's so many machines today and free weights that you can find that do something different than you normally do, and it still attacks the muscle. The muscle's only going to work one way. It's going to push. I mean, it's not going to push. It's going to pull. It, and the muscle always pulls. When you say you're doing pushes, another muscle is pulling that, that arm in that direction. Right. But people don't realize that, right? So when you are extending your arm, your triceps actually pulling your arm back like this. And you're curling your biceps, pulling your arm up. So when you do, you say I do push-pull method, it's... It's a phrase, but it's not really what it is. True, right. So from a muscle physiology standpoint, our muscles can only shorten right. or relax. Exactly. So when the muscle shortens, it's pulling the weight. Right. So you're not really pushing the weight. All right, there's things that uh, some people can't do. I remember years ago, I used to do overhead one-arm tricep extensions with a dumbbell to a point at where my elbows got so sore, I couldn't even lay them on the table. Right. They strain that, that tendon really bad. You had that? I have had that, and I'm um, battling a little... Uh, you know, biceps, uh, tendon uh, issue. But, you know, I think of it this way. I think that, that of this as a reminder that I need to check what I'm doing yeah. and continue to refine my thinking. And I know it's a challenge for all of us, but to, to refine my thinking and then listening to guys like Rick Drazen and understanding that there is a, we're on a journey. It's yeah. just the, the workout that you did today isn't the end of the road. You've got another... I don't know about you, you probably got 30, 40 years left in so, hope. <laughs> it's hope. And and so you're gonna to continue to modify that journey by virtue of the exercise choices, right. sets, reps, volume, etc., until you find that sweet spot for you today and then continue to refine that. Do as you get older though, and I don't think we talked about this, your strength 
Um, it does change. You don't have the strength you had 30 years ago. Or maybe it's not the desire to lift the heavy weight. Maybe that's more of it. Uh, to, to get the 150 pound dumbbells again, not even in my mind. Just, I mean, I'll go to the 40s or 50s. Uh, no, nah, I don't know that I could do it. In my mind, I don't want to do it. Right. You know, I want to go lighter. I want to get more reps. However, my body, particularly, always responded better to heavy weights. Right. So I'd like to think of it this way, Rick, and explain to people. So you have your exercise choices, and then within that, once you've made that choice, you've got your acute exercise variables. Okay. So that's how many repetitions, how much recovery time should I take in between my sets, and how many sets am I going to do all together? And lastly, how frequently do I want to train that body part or that muscle or however you're breaking up your right. workout? So these things take strong consideration. I heard you on an interview recently talked about you had a bodybuilder friend that at times trained their mess, trained his great biceps, and he trained them every day. Yeah. And that flies in the face of allowing a recovery time. <clears throat> right. Um, and... I would say that, first of all, that's an outlier, that that's going to work for somebody, and it might work, again, for a time, but probably not indefinitely. But we need to consider all these things. Um, the frequency, in my mind, with which you should train your upper body and lower body are a bit different, right? Yeah. Because our upper body has the potential to recover more rapidly okay. than a hard leg workout. Okay. And that, that's been, I think, a common theme for a long, long time. So how often do you think you should work the legs? Uh, twice a week. At most. And yes, uh, yeah, right. So I'm going to say uh, twice a week is obviously once every three or four days or once yeah. every four or five days. And upper body? Uh, twi two to three times a week. I mean, they can handle a greater exposure, but the, the, but the, again, the variable, there's more to it than that is the, the amount of volume. I would say the total volume. So if you took the number of exercises time and multiplied that by the number of sets and reps, uh, we could, you, there's also a more complex formula where you could add in how much weight you're using, but short of that, it's it's let's consider how much volume. So if I'm if I'm really feeling it, I'm getting to the gym six days a week. I'm going to use a lesser volume. But if there's uh, my schedule looking forward that I'm only going to be able to get to the gym three times a week, I'm going to load up on volume. At I that see. Time. Okay. Uh, years ago, a lot of the guys like Steve Reese used to train each body part three times a week. They didn't do a lot of sets, but they made good progress. And then as time moved on, it was down twice a week. And then I see people doing once a week. Once a week, that doesn't seem like to be enough. Uh, twice a week seems to be the norm. I think that's right. And I, th I think, again, in a, in a variable as we, as we take the journey through life is going to be the R. How is our age going to factor? And our nutrition and our sleep going to a factor into our ability to recover between working? Yeah, and that's the other thing. You need that recovery time. You need it. Uh, and it's really hard for people like us I mean, we understand that we have to take time off, and when we get up in the morning and say, okay, I'm not going to the gym today. What am I going to do? <laughs> I don't know what to do. So I'll go ride the bike just to do something, you know? Perfectly just, legitimate. Though. Yeah, yeah. Because you're used to training. It's, your, it's part of your life. It's part of my business to get up in the morning and go to the gym. If I don't go to the gym, I certainly don't want to sit home. No. Yeah. Well, and I'll add to this. I've, and I've, I've heard so many of your interviews where you discuss... Uh, you know, steady riding the bike or, or working the treadmill, steady mm -hmm. what I call steady state cardiovascular mm -hmm. activity because we want to strengthen and protect our heart and lungs. Mm -hmm. Certainly, a big part. There's all kinds of good things that come along with that. It's effect on our on our hormones. It's effect on our mood when we get that sweat going. However, one thing we can add to this, and we and this is uh, kind of an important thing that goes back to our days because we're both athletes outside of bodybuilding, and and that is so how about some intervals? How about getting on that bike or that treadmill and working? really hard for a minute and then allowing yourself to recover for a minute and repeating that for 8, 10, or 12 times. That makes sense. That sounds good. Yeah, that variety, it's it's a fat-burning uh, powerhouse. It's very, very effective. And again, it's quite different than steady. You've got steady state and then you've got high-intensity interval training. Uh, and to, to marry those two together, they don't need to be completely separate, but to alternate, for example, on the days you went to the gym, those two styles of cardiovascular activity, it's powerful. When do, you, when do you do enough cardio where you have to stop and when it starts burning muscle? You know, there's been a lot of research done into that, yeah. and I think you're going to get different answers from, from different, different folks. And, there's, uh, again, a, a variable there is going to be at what level your heart rate is. And some people have said, well, if you can keep that below 65% of your, your, mm -hmm. you know, uh, your, your maximum heart rate, and if you use a formula, a carbonate formula, which is 220 minus your age, and then multiply that by a percentile, for example, 6.65, it'll, it'll give you that number. Back. So figure about 65% if you wanted to do that math. And so if you get above that, uh, evidence suggests that you begin to um, 
sort of our energy system begins to pull from our skeletal muscle more so than our stored body fat. Obviously, we want to keep, you know, the the focus on stored body fat. Right, the exactly. Situation. That's what I was thinking because I know that when I when I moved out here, I used to run at the park. I used to run a couple of miles, and my body started to get stringy. I started my muscles started to get like just not there. Um, I was burning muscle because we're running so much. And I've run into that problem myself, and I and I would say that all of us, uh, uh, you know, people that are willing to mm -hmm. run and do hard cardio uh, have to wrestle with finding that point. I, I think it's a mistake though, I'll say this, that some of my friends, and I appreciate they're really trying to, to develop uh, skeletal muscle or, or at least maintain it as they age, um, but I, don't, I, I strongly suggest that you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater and abandon cardiovascular activity altogether because we're, again, we're all in this thing, bodybuilding is supposed to be really healthy for you. Right, right. I told somebody the other day, <laughs> Bodybuilding, you know, you're here for the health aspects, but there's a downside. There's the injury aspects because there's everybody I talk to has an injury. I've talked to a guy in the gym. He says everybody has pain. To what degree? Is it 1 to 10? Is it 2 to 5? Is it 2 to 3? But everybody has some pain. You never, ever have zero. No. So you don't ever have zero. And, and so don't expect it. Yeah. And then you'll have a 3 or a 5 or whatever that number is. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, training through that, it's better than the option. Yeah. Now you mentioned something about NFL players and and uh, having injuries from sports, and then how it figured into the exercise as well. Yeah. Well, the, the, what's going on is that uh, because the NFL players have a union, and they recently negotiated a contract that said that they don't are not required <clears throat> to practice as much in the off season with the team. Okay. Because. The players thought it was important that they have the freedom to live in a different city if they wanted oh, to. Sure, yeah. And I did that myself when I played with the Kansas City Chiefs. I lived here in Los Angeles in the offseason. Then I'd go back for the season. However, what they found out that the injury rate is going up because potentially, hypothetically, that the uh, without the strength and conditioning coach carefully monitoring the level uh, and volume of exercise that they're doing, that they're, the players are coming in to the regular season less prepared for the ravages of competition. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the future, but right now, the injury rate, the soft tissue injury rate amongst NFL players is higher than it's ever been before. And what's that from? I think it has to do with the off-season conditioning programs, and so the, the players bargained to have less off-season conditioning mm -hmm. and make it more optional to themselves, mm -hmm. and I think they miss, maybe they misstep. It was a misstep because it seems that evidence is suggesting that the more a uh, guided off-season exercise, strength and conditioning and running that the NFL players participate in, the less likely they are to suffer injuries in a regular season. That's very interesting, Neil. I didn't know that. It's very interesting. Um, in closing, what is your suggestion for somebody? Let's just say you train people. Some guy comes to you, he's 60 years old, and he says, look, I got to get in shape. I don't like looking like this. I was in shape when I was 30. I haven't really done anything in the gym. I don't know how to eat. What would you do with that person? Time and money is always a consideration for all of us. So how much, uh, look, a bro, I, I say sometimes you need a grown-up conversation. Yeah. How much time do you have to invest in yourself? It's right. not spending if, it, if you're getting something in return. It's investing. Right. And that's a personal trainer or a good gym or getting into a good group exercise gym, right. and money, how much money can you know? do you have budgeted to do that? So that gives us a, a, you know, an array of, of solutions right. that could range from getting a personal trainer and going down to Gold's Gym, or it could range to uh, joining a, a, a group exercise type of a gym like CrossFit or Orange Theory. I'm not getting paid for, from those companies, but a group exercise class can be a great way to, to um, to pull on the energy of others in a common cause. So yeah. I would highly recommend uh, one of those two strategies. At least to do something. Let's all get going. Get going. Uh, in closing, I have another question since it just came to me. There's a lot of personal trainers. What percentage of them do you think are good? What percentage do you think are bad? You know, you know I'd like to think of it as the rule of thirds. I think a, I think a third of all the certified personal trainers out there <clears throat> are, are good and worth the money. And a third are probably middle of the road, kind of hit and miss. And a third or a, a, an embarrassment to the profession. Yeah. You know, my eye goes out. I, I watch people and I observe in the gym. It's my nature to do it. I've been doing it for years, training for years. And I watch people and see what they're doing. And I see a lot of trainers that are just not even interested in their client. They're counting and they're looking away and they're on their phone. And I think they're, 
they think it's an easy way to make money. I'm going to become a person. How many people I've talked to? I'm sure you have to. What are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm studying to become a personal trainer. Do you work out? No, not really, but I'm going to become a trainer. You need to feel it, be able to, to do it, to sell it. You have to go through it yourself. Uh, there's a induction period where you have to work out, know what you're doing, have the feeling of what happens so you can relate to somebody else what they're going to feel when they do it, right? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I, there's a handful of certifications that I believe in. And I'm, I'm going to name drop and say, uh, for anybody interested out there, I think the ISSA, International Sports Sciences Association, its co-founder is my mentor, Dr. Fred Hatfield, Dr. Squat. Oh, yeah, sure. One of the great power sure. lifters of all time. And it's, it's got a really good uh, course curriculum. And if you, if you can get certified through there, that's a good start. From there, you need to find, if you, at the, in the best case scenario, a trainer aspiring should find a mentor, somebody to work with. Get to the gym, keep sharpening your own blade. That means get to the gym and, and work on your own craft They're daily, Yeah, every day. What do you think about having a training partner versus not having a training partner? I think a training partner can be uh, invaluable. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, There are potential pitfalls if you get into some lazy habits with that person mm -hmm. or fall into a rut, but they, they've got a, a potential big upside. If you're, uh, I'm, I'm, I've got a strong internal drive, so I'm okay without one. However, a lot of people, not so self driven so they could benefit from one. I'm all, I, I think I'm almost better with that one. I mean, my girlfriend trains with me when she does, we do hit it hard, but I train 95% of it myself. Uh, I always found that even back in the day, I couldn't count on the person to show up on time to train. And I'm sitting in the gym waiting, I said, this is 20 minutes I could have been halfway done. You know? And yeah. So I started doing it myself, and I don't have any problem motivating myself to go to the gym and train. It's just what we do, you know, it's embedded in us that we're going to train hard, we do our sets. Actually, there's less time between sets because I'm not there with somebody. Agreed. And, and there's a little mental drill that I, that I do with myself. And I've been stood up by training partners not, not too long ago myself. And it's, it's not all, it, it's, it's, it's mentally sort of emotional draining. Guys like me and you, I've never talked with you about this, but I know you. And when you walk into the gym, there's a switch that goes on. It's, it's like go time. Yeah. It's go time. And if you get there and you're in go time and you're waiting and you're waiting for your training partner, you're losing your, you're losing that mojo. Totally. Bad news. So totally. you, you got to go and you got to get your business. And that's one thing good about, you know, I learned from playing on a, you had your, I had my sports teams in, in their strength and conditioning rooms and you had the Gold's Gym and your, your golden era of yeah. bodybuilding partners. Yeah. And there's a, there's an energy and a camaraderie there that is, is palpable. And it's because you were there in the common cause and it was go time at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Very, very difficult in real life to duplicate that environment. And if you can't find that environment, uh, go get it yourself. Yeah, we didn't have cell phones and distractions back then. When I walk in the gym now, people are on their cell phones, they're distracted, they're talking about this, they're doing that, you know, they're sitting on the machine with their legs crossed talking. Um, we didn't have that. We got in, fired right up, our first set, ready to go. Now I don't do the first set anymore because it's too painful. I'm going to tell you what I do instead. I start with the second set. That doesn't hurt as much. Good thinking. <laughs> yeah. I was going to think warm up, but that's even better. <laughs> no, I don't have time to warm up. I got to work out. Thank you, Pete, for being here. Uh, if they want to catch you on the uh, internet, where can we find you? I'm on Facebook, uh, Pete Koch one I guess, and uh, also PeteKoch.com. Also, keep in mind that Pete's going to have his own show coming up soon. I'm going to help him with it, and then we're going to put it on here and talk about it, and then put a link for you so you guys can go on and, and give him props for his show and work with him. Okay? Thanks, Rick. Okay, my pleasure. See you guys next time. Thanks for watching this one. Equalizer, baby. See you next time.